Hi everyone, it's Donna from redcarpetlearning.com. I am so glad to be providing for you today another one of Donna's interviews with experts. And we have one of my favorite people on today. I am really thrilled to welcome him. Before we do that, I want to acknowledge uh, that this is not my typical background, not my typical office. We are filming this in March of 2020 when everyone, including myself and my guests, are sheltering in place to help people, people feel safe or uh, keep them safe from the spread of COVID-19. And so forgive that I am filming from my bedroom, but that's what we're all called to do today. So uh, let me get right to it. I'm so excited about today's guest. He is actually, uh, was the president of the National Speakers Association the first year that I went to the NSA, that's the National Speakers Association convention. So he has a special place in my heart and it is Stephen Tweed. He is an internationally known healthcare and business strategist, award-winning speaker and author and the CEO of Leading Home Care and the founder of the Home Care CEO Forum. Uh, he is the author of I think a couple of books actually but the one that we're going to be talking about today is Conquering the Crisis. Proven solutions for, yes, thank you, there it is. Proven solutions for caregiver recruitment and retention. Stephen, it's so good to have you here with me today. Thank you, Don. It's always a pleasure to be with you. I, I value so much the work that you're doing with your clients around uh, red carpet service. And uh, so it's a joy to support you in doing that. Thank you. And as you know, we have, you know, really a lot of ideas in common or, or our mission, our passions, uh, we have them in common because as I mentioned, just as we were getting ready to film this, that I have your book. I sat in at a leading age uh, association convention a couple of years ago. I sat in your session and I was taking notes furiously, but I was also going, yes, 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 to everything you said. Um, which is why I'm so excited to have you here to talk to our audience about uh, something they've been bringing up to me for years, and that is the challenges that they have with recruiting the right people and then retaining them, uh, particularly caregivers. So uh, let's, let's start with, tell me a little bit about the caregiver crisis. What, what is that? What does that mean? What prompted you to write this book? Well, the caregiver crisis really comes down to pure demographics, Donna. There simply are not enough individuals working in healthcare in the caring professions to meet the needs of an aging population. And our niche is in-home personal care. So that's caregivers providing assistance with the activities of daily living, light housekeeping, meal preparation, mostly for seniors, but also for some younger folks with, with disabilities or, or uh, who need assistance. Um, and then uh, these companies that I work with provide that care on an hourly basis, either on a private pay basis where families purchase the service for their elder or through state programs like the Medicaid waiver programs. Um, there are about 26,000 companies in this niche across the United States, and many of them are, are small companies. And so um, actually it began for us back in 2006 when we began to notice that these home care companies were really having a hard time finding caregivers. And we did some research thinking it was about recruiting, but then we realized that yes, recruiting is important, but selection is the key of getting the right people and then onboarding and training, but then retention. How do you keep those right people once you find them? Right. So we've been doing ongoing research with that. We started a program back in 2006 called Caregiver Quality Assurance. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course the bottom fell out of the economy in 2008, 2009, and the crisis was not as critical, but it's been growing steadily over the last decade. And so we get to 2018, 2019, companies are really challenged with finding and keeping people. Uh, we'll see what happens after the coronavirus crisis of 2020 and, and what goes on. Um, so that's what we do. That's what we're about. 
Um, I really am doing two things right now with my business. One is leading a, a series of what we call mastermind groups. And you and I know mastermind groups in the speaking profession. In our case, we introduced it to the home care industry in, in 2012. And these are groups of companies, the CEO and the COO, who come together twice a year face-to-face -to, -face to share ideas, to solve problems, to support one another. Uh, and then they meet once a month by Zoom video conference. So we have four of those groups now, about 42 companies uh, in four different groups. And so I work with them on an ongoing basis. And one of the things that is coming up more frequently now is the caregiver recruiting and retention crisis. Um, I, I wrote this book in 2017, and then uh, we've continued to speak and write ab about the topic, but mostly we've been applying it uh, with the CEOs in our own mastermind groups. Yeah, and I want to I want to acknowledge a couple of things. One being that yes, you, and your niche is in home care. I can tell you, working a lot in senior living and in healthcare. Yeah. Uh, now that they are fa they've been facing the same thing, you know, that yep. we've been hearing the same thing. And uh, that so a lot of what you're going to talk about today while your research was in home care definitely applies to not just senior living in healthcare, but there are some principles I know apply across the board if you're yep. looking to retain employees. I also do want to acknowledge that you're right. Uh, we're right now in the middle or possibly at the very beginning of this whole uh, COVID-19 crisis. And that may have changed everything um, for the healthcare industry in terms of that the people don't have jobs and they are the ones who have jobs to offer them. So I know later on, we'll talk about some of the insights that have come out of some of your mastermind um, and some of the, the new thinking that we might have around uh, retaining or, or selection of team members and then retaining them. So, um, good. yeah, let's start with, because it's very research-based if I remember correctly. So tell me a little bit about the research you did and the data that you found related to this crisis. Well, um, part of what triggered writing the book um, was watching the caregiver turnover numbers over the last 10 years. And in 2009, caregiver turnover in the home care industry was about 39%. Right. In 2018, it was almost 82%. Wow. And it was been a straight line curve from 39 to 82. And so uh, we continued to, to discuss that because certainly recruiting is key to get new people in. But if you're spending a huge amount of time and effort getting new people in, but they're going out the door, mm -hmm. then it's like a, a, a gerbil on a, on a treadmill or on a wheel. Um, and, and so one of the pieces of data coming out of our industry benchmarking study is that about 80% of the turnover happens in the first 90 days. And I suspect that's true in senior living and long-term care. Yeah. I suspect it's true in other industries you serve like retail and, and food service. Um, and so as we looked at that 90 day turnover, we've really dug deeply into working with our mastermind leaders on things that they're doing to, uh, improve that 90 day turnover. Mm -hmm. And what we've learned, um, about reducing 90 day turnovers, first of all, you got to select the right people to begin with. And so we're actually going back and, and reframing and rebuilding our caregiver quality selection system to help our members do a better job of selection. And of course, good selection starts with good quality applicants. So you got to go to the front end of your whole recruiting process. Right. Um, so getting the right people to begin with becomes the key. The second thing we learned, and again, I think this applies to your client group as well, is that when a caregiver comes to work for a home care company, they have an idea of how many hours a week they want to work. Do they want to work full time? Do they want to work part time? And if it's part time, how many hours? So let's say we have two people. One wants to work 40 hours a week and one work, wants to work 20 hours a week. And that's their idea. Well, what we found is that we would hire caregivers, put them to work. 
And if they weren't getting the number of hours that they wanted or needed to pay their bills and pay the rent, and then they would look for something else. And it was not about the dollars per hour, but it was, do they have enough hours to get enough income to meet their living needs? Right. Um, the other thing we found was that a new caregiver would come, come to work, be assigned to a client. And let's say they were getting 20 hours a week with that client. If that client went in the hospital, passed away, went into a senior living community, and that caregiver no longer had that 20 hours, if they didn't get rescheduled within two or three days, they had to go somewhere else and find other work because they're depending on that regular paycheck. Right. And so working with our client companies and their scheduling departments to make sure that that new caregiver who's brand new, so they're not really on the radar of the scheduling department. If they if they if they if their hours fall off or they fall to zero, if they don't get rescheduled quickly, they leave. And right. so we've got to keep that new employee in the in the in the on the radar of the scheduler because they have their their ones that they like and they know and they trust and they call the same people over and over and over again. I suspect that happens in senior living and long-term care as well, that the people who scheduled the, the aides and the, even the nurses and, and other employees, they have the ones that they sort of know and trust and like and the ones that aren't on their radar. So putting in place systems to keep those newer employees on the radar of the schedulers so that they can get the hours they want. And bringing that even back closer to home, I was talking with my son the other day, and my 17-year-old grandson works in a, a little retail store near their house. And um, I was asking him, well, how's Jason doing with his, his work? He said, well, he likes to work, but he's not getting enough hours. Right. So he will undoubtedly end up going somewhere else. Um, so um, for our listeners, being cognizant that when we're dealing with, with particularly with relatively low income, people who I've learned a new term the other day studying people who are sort of financially fragile. Oh, um, they, they can't deal with two days with no work or three days with no work. Or if they have a $400 financial emergency, they, they don't have $400 saved up. Right. So uh, making sure that the people get the number of hours that they need and want to match their lifestyle. Right. And then the third big element um, of 90 day retention is people want to feel connected. They want to feel valued and appreciated. They want to be doing meaningful work. And when, and we, we find it in home care, your clients in long-term care and senior living find it. And probably even in, in, in retail and some other service businesses is that the employee wants to feel like the work they do matters for someone. Right. In our case, the, the, the long-term seasoned, what I call professional caregivers in home care, they've been doing this for 25 years. They love their clients. They are really committed to taking care of their clients and, and, and they have a passion for their work. Uh, so they wanna be doing meaningful work. The, the, the second is they, they wanna feel valued and appreciated by their client. Right. And so when they're getting feedback, whether it's directly from the client, when the oldest daughter who's the primary family caregiver writes a note or calls up mm -hmm. and says thank you very much for what Sally did for my mom um, and then the third is they want to feel valued and appreciated by their immediate supervisor mm -hmm. and so what are we doing as a supervisor to help those employees feel like they're valued and appreciated um, and then they want to feel valued and appreciated by the organization by the company by the leaders by the and and and, and then um, in our business, at least, our caregivers want flexibility. They want to control when they work and when they don't work. Um, and it's one of the interesting things we've learned about caregivers who really like working in the home versus caregivers who like working in a facility, in a senior living community, uh -huh. is the, the people working in the, in the senior living community want stability and consistency. They want to know that their shift is from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. every day. Um, and, and have that consistency, whereas the people working in home care want the flexibility to work when they want to work and not, and, and to 
let them know wh when they want to work so that they can adjust their schedule. Uh, more um, of an entrepreneurial spirit, really. That's right. That's right. right. And the last thing they want is to feel fairly paid. And we did a, stir a, a, a survey of best caregivers. The seventh item on why you stay here was, was pay. And so it reinforced that people don't quit for money if they're doing meaningful work, if they're feeling valued and appreciated by their clients, their supervisor, and the company. They won't quit for money. But when people quit and you ask them, why did you leave? They say, I got a better job. And the in, in, in inference is, well, I got more money. Well, maybe they did, but, it, but they didn't go out looking for that job to get more money. They went out looking for a job because they didn't feel good about their supervisor. Um, there were challenges. You, well, you've seen the research. It says people don't quit companies. They quit their boss, their right. supervisor. Right. And so these are all the things that are, that are coming out of the research that we're doing by talking to best caregivers and by validating that data by talking to multiple companies in our industry niche. And I feel, I remember that when you talked about like, first of all, number seven, you know, being more money. Um, and I do question just to deviate from the thought that I originally had for a second, I do question like all the money that's going out the window because we're not retaining these people. If that could be better utilized to, you know, beef up some, uh, some pay scales. Yeah. Um, but what I did find fascinating, I remember you saying this in your session at leading age that really when you asked why people stayed, it was feeling valued. It was feeling, um, connected. It was, you know, meaningful work to do. Uh, and, the, and, yeah, and then maybe it was scheduling and those kind of things. But when they left, that's when the, the, the um, subject of pay actually came up, right? It was something, there was something real specific you said about that, that I was like, wow, that was fascinating. Right. Well, and the other thing we've learned, and I, I, I created a little mantra from this research, we learned that money matters more in recruiting than in retention. That was it, yes. Tell this me is based on, on uh, one of our mastermind groups. We were having a conversation about this, and, and one of our members, one of our charter members from the very beginning of this group, um, was sort of taking in this conversation. And you could almost see it in his face, his little light bulb went on. And he said, um, we've done really well with crafting the culture of our company. And, and our turnover is relatively low. And he said, our recruiting ads have been all about the culture. And this is a great place to work. And he said, I thought about that. And I thought, I'm going to test something out. And he said, I went back home after the mastermind meeting. And I rewrote my job ads to talk about money, pay, benefits, uh, 401k plans, paid time off. And I, I, I tested different things. And he said, when I started talking about money in my ads or, or benefits related to money, my number of applications shot up by 400%. Oh, wow. Wow. And so then he said, I really had to crank down my selection system because I had all these applicants, most of whom I wouldn't even interview. But we did get a lot more applicants. We got more quality applicants. We improved our selection system. And we got really good people. And once they came on board and they became part of our culture, then they didn't leave and they didn't leave for money. Right. And we didn't, we didn't raise the, the amount of money we were paying. We didn't say make $2 an hour more here than we simply referenced money in the ad. When we got their attention, we got them into our system. We brought them in, we interviewed them, we sold them on our company. They went through orientation, we brought them in and they stayed. That's great. And so the realization is that in advertising and recruiting, money gets their attention. Then we get them in the door into our system and if we've crafted the culture. And right. I'm doing a lot of work right now with, with our mastermind members and our individual consulting and coaching clients around crafting the culture. Mm -hmm. And you and I have talked about this before, how important culture is, whether it's 
related to customer service or whether it's related to the customer experience in home care or caregiver recruiting and retention. Right. And a very interesting conversation just last week with one of my uh, strategic coaching clients. And this is a fairly large company in the industry. And they retained me uh, almost a year ago to help them craft their culture. And this is a family owned business and the CEO wanted me to help him craft the culture and help him, me, him with the transition to his children and getting them ready to take over the company. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very interesting project, but in, in, in February, so a couple of weeks ago, we had our monthly uh, Zoom video uh, team call. And he said, I have, I have some interesting data that I wanna share with the team. And he shared his screen and brought up a graph and it was the monthly turnover number in January of 2019, all, every month through December. And, and the monthly turnover in January was 10% of the workforce. The monthly turnover in December was less than 1%. And he said, I attribute this totally to the work we've been doing around the company culture. Yeah. And he said, it started with our family and our leadership team. We got it out to all of our offices. We've been really reinforcing the culture. The people in the offices have been reinforcing it with the caregivers. And we're, we're now seeing the tangible, measurable results of this in the reduction in employee turnover. Oh, that is And awesome. as you mentioned, if, if your turnover is such that all of your, your recruiting effort is going to replace the people who left, then you can't grow. Right. And so in order to grow, you have to have a net increase in, in the number of new employees. Um, so it's very interesting how the culture piece that you and I have often talked about mm -hmm. and the retention piece go hand in glove. Mm -hmm. And recruiting is critical to find the right applicants and then selection to make sure we pick the right people and then orient them and train them and, and, and introduce them to our company culture so that we make that culture come alive. And when we do that, then they stay. Yeah. So it's, it's been a fascinating year of connecting culture, recruiting, selection, onboarding, and retention. Right. Oh, that's so, that's amazing. I mean, your research is just amazing and the results that you're getting. And you're right. I mean, you and I are definitely, uh, we've had this conversation on the same page of culture is everything because if you don't, uh, you have a culture, whether you cr craft it, and I love that word, crafting your culture, whether you craft a culture or you just kind of let it happen, you have one. <laughs> it's just the more, <laughs> yeah, the more intentional. I want to, and we, and we'll, let's talk about that, but I want to go back to the beginning. I love what you taught us about recruiting and how the numbers, where that really matter, where that really makes a difference. I want to go back to, uh, for a minute to selection, because I know, you know, some of the things that we see with our clients are, they are so, so busy and a they're not getting as many applicants so hopefully your tip was going to help them do that um, but they are also so busy and it takes a lot of effort to train new people and all of that that it kind of does become like you say the hamster in the in the wheel um, where they're not really taking the time to select the right people because they just have to have people and particularly in senior living there are you know numbers that have to be met just to have a certain number of people on the floor um, right. but when you just have warm bodies on the floor uh, who really don't have the time to get connected to the culture and aren't trained well and that kind of thing it, it makes it difficult um, and selection is key there. Um, right. But people, what would you say to people who, who come back to you and say, but we don't have time, you know, to really <laughs> select the right people. We have more money than time then because we know what it costs. Exactly. Uh, we actually did some research on, uh, we actually created a little tool called the bad hire calculator. And it helps you put real dollars to show what it costs when you hire somebody and they leave within 90 days. 
Mm -hmm. um, and, and in a caregiver's, uh, in a $10 an hour caregiver, uh, the cost of a bad hire is about $1,575. You hear all kinds of stuff out there about what, it, what turnover costs, yeah. but we use real numbers with real data from real home care companies and plugged it into a formula and said, in, in real dollars. So if you have 100 caregivers and 80 of them leave, times $1,500, well, you do the math. Right. Um, and, and so when we look at s selection, again, we're really working at fine tuning what we call the caregiver quality selection system. And in fact, we were talking about that today. We have some folks that we work with in London, England um, on an assessment tool, and we were doing a Zoom call across the pond um, because what we realized is that, that um, good selection starts with the job. Right. You have to know the purpose of the job. We have a tool called the Role Clarity Worksheet. So it's the purpose of the job, the five key accountabilities for that job, and, and, and the metrics. How are we going to measure performance on that job? Right. And so we get real clear about the job. And then we look at what are the core competencies of the best performers in that job. And so we have done a best caregiver study with our mastermind groups to, to get them to identify their 20 best caregivers. And then we've done a little survey using SurveyMonkey to gather some information data about right. the best caregivers. Right. And so when you know what the job looks like, and then you know what the characteristics of the best performers in that job are, then you can go out and build your selection system. And, and so we, we're, we're, and we're fine tuning this right now because we continue to gather more information and more data. And so we're looking at sort of at the four elements of, of selection. One is the pre-screening. Um, what are the musts and, and the wants in the person? And if there are four or five things that they absolutely must have in our initial telephone interview, we can ask some questions and, and quickly screen people out. For example, in the home care industry, these caregivers are driving from client to client. So they must have reliable transportation, a car. They must have a driver's license. Um, they must have insurance. Right. Um, because of the nature of our industry, they need to be able to pass a criminal background check. And most of our companies are drug-free workplaces, so they must be able to pass a drug screen. And so we have those five questions. And if, if if we get a no answer to any of those questions in a telephone screen, we say, thank you very much. This is not a good fit. Right. Sorry. Or thank you very much. We'll get back to you. <laughs> you know how that will process. <laughs> um, and then we're, we're finding some other pre-screening questions that we can do on the telephone. So we have a clearly thought out telephone screening interview that's going to screen out, depending on your recruiting methods, you may screen out 50% of the applicants just on that 15 minute telephone call. Right, right. Then the next phase is live interviews. And we've really developed three different parts of the interview. The first one is the culture fit interview. And we, we've designed a, a tool where you take the core values of the company that make up your culture. And in our work, I don't know what you're doing around core values and culture, but we're getting our clients to pick three core values. Mm -hmm. Because if you, if you pick four, maybe they'll remember, if you get to five, people can't remember more than four core values. Right. And I don't know, but you have our companies that have seven, and it, that seems to make sense. And then you say, okay, pick a person, list the core values, they get to three, they can't remember four or five and forget about six or seven. Exactly, so they, get, yeah. which makes them pointless. <laughs> right. so you get those three core values. So now we have a little interview tool that says, tell me about what you really believe that guides your thoughts and actions. And you get people talking about their core beliefs. Um, then you say, well, one of our, our uh, core beliefs is pick one, excellence. Now, when we work with our clients on culture, if they pick excellence, we, we get them to define what does that really mean and what are the behaviors that go with that. Right. And so we've, we've really defined what excellence is and how it fits into our culture. 
And so we say to the applicant, one of our core values is excellence. And here are the five behaviors that go with that. Give me an example of how your values and your work are in alignment with our core value. Give me an example of a situation where you experienced work that was not excellent and what did you do with it? And so you have three or four questions and then another core value is respect. And here's what we believe about treating everybody with dignity and respect and these are the behaviors. Give me an example of how you have demonstrated respect on the job. Right. And so you're, you're getting people, the applicant, to talk with you about your core values and their core beliefs and are they in alignment. And we have a little one to five rating scale for each question. And so the interviewer can ask the same questions to every applicant, put a little score, there's a place for notes. And now we're developing a consistency among applicants, but also a consistency among interviewers around culture fit. Right, right. The next part of the, of the interview is, is the job fit interview. And this is where we're looking at a person's past experience and the extent to which it helps prepare them to be a good fit for our job. Mm -hmm. And so we say, tell, tell us about your last three employers. Give me the name of your supervisor. Now talk to me a little bit about the, the first job, three jobs ago. And again, we have a series of prescribed questions, about four questions. And so we, we talk them through three jobs ago, then two jobs ago, then the last job. And of course, the last question for each of those is, well, why did you leave that job right. and go on to the next one? Right. So now what we're getting is information around the person's work ethic, around how they got along with their immediate supervisor, um, were they doing meaningful work and how important was that? Did they feel valued and appreciated? And so we're getting at some of those core issues around what we do. And then the third part of the interview is the, is the skills fit interview. And this is where we get into specific skills. So in the case of home care, caregiver needs to be able to transfer a, a client from bed to wheelchair or uh, help them walk with a, a gate belt or help them in and out of the shower. Um, so there are certain skills that they need to have. And so in that interview, we have some structured questions to get at their skills, but then once they're hired, they're, they'll also go through an orientation program where there's a skills checklist or skills trainings yeah. so that we're making sure that the applicant does in fact have the skills that are needed. And I'm sure you've said this to your clients. We say hire for attitude, train for skills. Mm -hmm. so we want to get the person who fits the culture and fits the job. And if, if they need to know how to run a Hoyer lift, we can teach them that. Right. If they need to know how to, and of course, in these day, this day and age, infection control is a big deal. Right. And we can teach the caregiver about infection control and gloves and masks and, right. and sanitation if they have the right value system and the right work ethic or work attitude, then we can we can teach them the skills they need to know. But if they come with those skills already, that's, that's going to be a plus. So, yeah. So one, one of the things I'm hearing is to have a very well-defined system for how you select people. And then you want to make sure that everybody who has a responsibility for that selection process is well-trained on how to do that and committed to, I'm sure in, in each of these um, categories that there's a score that if you, you know, if you're not up to a certain point, it's not the right fit, right? That's right. That's yeah, right. yeah. Yeah, so, one of the principles is we only want to hire A players. So even if somebody's a B or a C player, that's not good enough for us. We right. only want A players. And so and we're, going to, we're going to take people in the top 10% of the applicants that are available. That's awesome. um, even if we have to stretch ourselves a little bit, uh, in filling those positions. And I love what you just said, because that the, the managers that I have seen who have been really uh, 
successful in retaining team members is when they focus on that selection process. And they have even themselves been out there on the floor doing the work yeah. while they are, so that they're just not filling holes with warm bodies, which doesn't serve anyone. And it's also not fair to the people that they serve as well to have that happening. So, um, so that's awesome. So, okay, so next step then is getting people connected to your culture, which is, you know, my huge passion. And I know that starts with orientation and, uh, you know, how you onboard people, how you orient them. And I don't know if you find this in home care, but I definitely see it in uh, both senior living and healthcare at large, that people and outside those fields, quite frankly, where, but especially in healthcare and senior living, where people are really, their orientations become very compliance centric, like all of the things they have to teach them because the state mandates it. And so there is very little connection to the organization, but that's really where that connection to culture should start, don't you think? Yes, it is. And there's, there's two parts of it. Well, we say, and I don't know if, if you have a similar definition of culture, but we, did, we talk about culture as the way we do things around here. Exactly, yep. The way we do things around here is really driven by four key elements. Number one is the leadership style of the CEO. Mm -hmm. And so I say to my owners and CEOs, whatever the culture is, it's all your fault. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, if it's a great culture, you get the credit. So it begins with the leadership yeah. of the CEO. And my favorite example is uh, a company in the home care space called Biata Home Health. And they're based in Morristown, New Jersey. Um, I won't go into all the details of the company. They're a billion and a half dollars in, in sales. That's a billion with a B. Um, Family-owned company. And Mark Biata is the founder and he started this company in 1975 in downtown Philadelphia as a small private pay in-home care company, personal care. And he grew it to this big uh, organization. And he spent 40 years focusing on the culture. And they call it the Biota Way. And we could go on for hours talking about all of the little things that they did. But my favorite was, um, he, Mark and I met for breakfast one, one summer. And it was in August of, of, of um, 2015 in, in Avalon, New Jersey. I was vacationing at the Jersey Shore. I, we got connected up. We met for breakfast at Uncle Bill's Pancake House in Avalon. And he handed me this plasticized, I usually have some around. I don't have, I'm right at my desk. But it's the size of a business card. Right. And it's a four-fold plastic folder and it's called the Biota Way. And it has their company vision, their company mission, their three core values, and there's a panel for each of the core values. And, and they pass those out wholesale. I mean, just everybody in the company has a handful of those cards. And throughout the day, throughout the week, they're constantly coming back to talk about the three core values and have different ways of reinforcing that. We visited their global support center um, outside of Morristown, New Jersey, this past summer. And even the meeting rooms are labeled by one of the core values. So one of their core values is excellence, and there's a meeting room called excellence. So you were asking, well, how do you reinforce that after the initial orientation? Well, it looks for innovative and creative ways to reinforce that. Um, I was working with this company that I was telling you about that reduced their turnover from 10% a month to 1% a month. And I shared with them the Biota Way card. And, and by the way, if folks want to see that, the company is B-A-Y-A-D-A.com. And there's a, a, up at the banner at the top, there's a button that says the Biota Way. Great. So you can go there and look that up and see it. It's it's out there for everybody to see. And that's one of the reasons I'm very comfortable using them as an example, because they're very open about what they've done to, to build the culture. So anyway, I shared that with my client. And I'll they- link in the notes too. Just oh, okay, great, put a link to the, the Biata. And, and so my client 
got a copy of the of the card. They liked it. They create. They took their own core values. They created their own little little card, and and they made a big deal of distributing those. And and, and they started with their leaders, and then their branch managers, and then out to their caregivers. One of the things that came out of it is that a couple of the people in their offices took some principles from the values and they created their own caregiver pledge. And it, it's like a little rhyme. And so they crafted this pledge. And so um, every caregiver has a name badge. It goes on a lanyard with their picture. And then on the back of it, there's some other information. They created a duplicate card, the same size. And on one side of the card are the three core values of the company. On the other side are or the, is the pledge. And one of the things they're doing in their staff meetings is they start by having somebody read the pledge. Every day, every meeting. Oh, it awesome. takes 15 seconds to read it. Get it in, get so it in, get it in. Those kinds of things that companies with a strong culture do that are different, as you said, than the companies that, yeah, we have these values and we tell people at orientation and, and there's a plaque on the wall, but nothing ever happens with leadership to reinforce those core values. Yeah. yeah. And so we said, you know, uh, the culture is driven by the leadership style of the CEO, by the core values that guide your thoughts and actions, by the behavior that you expect, and by the behavior that you permit. The, I'm sorry, repeat that last one? The behavior you permit. Permit. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and you know my wife and business partner, Elizabeth Jeffries, and yeah. in her work with executives in healthcare and her leadership retreat, she says, the behavior you permit, you promote. Mm -hmm. And so as we look at that culture, here's the behavior we expect, but what are the consequences if people demonstrate behavior that's different than what we expect? If we permit it, now we're saying it's okay. And so it really is a very interesting process for leaders to get clear about the core values and the behavior that goes with that, and then to reinforce it. But then how do you hold people accountable if they, if they behave differently? Yeah. And I would imagine, and I heard someone say um, years ago, and I wish I remembered who it was, I would give them credit, but it was, if you, you know, if you have all these behaviors and they're well-defined, but people can get away without delivering on them, then they were just really good ideas. You know, it, it's not really your culture. It's just a good idea you had one day that you're not really adhering to. Um, exactly. But I also think uh, getting back to the retention piece, and I'm getting, I'm thinking about also those behaviors and what they mean in terms of how really the first step is looking at how leaders behave with their team members because is it when it comes to culture wouldn't that be maybe the number one thing that is going to create uh, either a high employee retention or a high employee turnover experience yes yes well and, and as you know when you're working when you when you're building a team and you bring people together that share those core values and share the the sort of the mission of the business, the purpose why we're here, then they reinforce the positive behavior and employees will call out people whose behavior is not consistent with what's expected. Okay. And I love this quote you may have run into uh, to him. William Pollard was uh, chairman uh, of the board of a company called Service Master Corporation. And, and he wrote a book called Soul of the Firm. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he has this quote in here. He says, people want to work for a cause, not just a living. Mm -hmm. When there's an alignment between the cause of the company and the cause of the people, move over because there will be extraordinary performance. Yes. And so that goes back to what we were saying is that, that people want to do meaningful work. Now, the flip side of that is another phrase that I created that's sort of the antithesis of this. And it says that people who want to work don't want to work with people who don't want to work. Mm 
Mm. <laughs> I love it. It's so, so true. You, you have seen that in, in your work. If you're talking yeah. about the customer experience in red carpet service, if, if there's a bunch of people in that company who really don't want to deliver red carpet service, then the people who believe in that don't want to work there. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'm even seeing this now with, uh, you know, a company that has a lot of turnover and we're trying to improve the onboarding experience, but you can see the team members who have been there for a while, they've just been through so many of these people that they're kind of resident, reticent to make people feel welcome, to, you know, give them a positive first experience because they don't you know, they've just seen people come and go and maybe they weren't the right select, you know, the selection process wasn't as good as it could have been. And um, so, yeah, people don't want to work. People who want to work don't want to work with people who don't want to work. I love that. Right, right. I love that. And so we craft this culture and get people who do want to work and do want to do what we're doing because it matters. It's that meaning, it's the cause that, that he talked about. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, you and I work in healthcare and home care and senior living and long-term care. Uh, but even in some of your other clients, whether it's, it's retail or food service, if people believe that what they do matters, then they want to work with people who also believe what they are doing matters. And, and we, we, we build this culture that, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. Yeah. But the flip side of it is if, if we're bringing in people who don't want to work, then then we deflate the, the morale, we, we deflate the enthusiasm, and then people leave. Yeah. So it's, it's all tied together. Yeah, it is. And I love the... Um, it, I, the idea of people want to be aligned with a purpose. I love that too. I totally am right on board with that. And and this is going to lead me into my second to last question for you. Uh, okay. Because I think we're seeing this now going like reminding everyone that we're filming this during the COVID-19 outbreak of 2020. And we're seeing now everybody has a shared common purpose. You know, I did a video on this. We all, you know, we all want to defeat this thing. We want to save people's lives. Uh, we want to see it go away or, you know, we want to get a cure and we want the economy to bounce back and all of these things. And we are all aligned in that purpose. And so you can see people stepping up either by staying home or the healthcare people are saving lives, senior living are keeping their elderly, you know, safe home care as well, uh, grocery store clerks, everybody has a very well-defined role and we are all working towards that common purpose. And as a result, we will get through this. So I, I think, you know, it's such a great example of what's going on now that you could take back to your organization and say, is, my, is our purpose clearly defined and are we inspiring people to become to want to be a part of that um, exactly. but going into going back to the whole like okay now our world in the last couple of weeks Stephen, <laughs> has completely changed um what do you think you were telling me before we got out we started filming that even in your mastermind there's been some conversation around what is it going to be like now you know uh that there people are seeing more applicants so what is how is right. all of this going to relate uh to healthcare senior living home care in the future right well all of our companies that we work with are still working they're necessary uh essential workers and most of them are are dispersed and working from home and their caregivers are still going into and out of the homes of their clients. Um, and two weeks ago, the biggest barrier to growing that company was the shortage of caregivers. And so then COVID-19 comes along, and in talking with our clients the last couple of days, most of them, their hours are about the same. Some are up a little bit, some are down a little bit. Some of their caregivers are sheltering in place. Right. Some clients don't want a, a a non-family member coming in and out of the house but for the most part um, and then we're seeing people moving out of facilities back home because of the danger of being in a nursing home or in a, so there's lots of dynamics but we were talking yesterday and they're saying all of a sudden uh, our online recruiting uh, channels are being filled with new applicants 
So people that worked in food service or other companies that are shut down are looking for work. And so I said, well, what's the implication of that going forward? And they said, well, it's going to be easier to find applicants, but now we need to really crank up our selection system. We need to be much more selective. Um, and it will give us the opportunity to be more selective. Mm -hmm. The other interesting thing they said was, it's also going to give us an opportunity to, to sort of prune away some dead wood at the bottom of the, of the bell curve. Mm -hmm. uh, if we have people that we hired that aren't performing well, but they're still working because we needed them, as we get more applicants, more high quality applicants, as we do a better job of selection, we will be able to, to use the best people. And it's not that we'll terminate people, but, but the people who were the lower performers will not get scheduled and they will end up going away. Right. Uh, and that will, again, rising tide lift all boat. The quality of our caregiver pool increases as we go through this process. Yeah. And so recruiting will be different. Selection will be dramatically different. Right. Onboarding will be different. Uh, um, we'll see what happens with retention. You know, we, when, when we get through the initial crash and stores open and restaurants open and other businesses open, will those people who came into home care or into senior living for a short period of time go back or will they stay? And it could be an amazing opportunity to have more people see that, gee, this is, a, this is a, an important profession. I can come into home care or senior living or long-term care and I can make a difference and I can do meaningful work and I'll feel valued and appreciate. I'm going to stay here. That's um, where culture comes in. So you can, yeah. I mean, you can have all these people come in and then select the right ones, but then you want to keep them. And so you're right, really focusing on what is that purpose? What are our core values? What are those behaviors? How are we inspiring people and training them and continually reinforcing that cult intentional culture that we've crafted? Um, exactly. That's where retention, you know, that's what helps with retention. So, oh, this exactly. has been fantastic. Steven, is there anything I haven't asked you that you uh, you'd like to add? Oh, uh, this has been so much fun, Donnie. You and I, you and I could go on for hours doing this, and I know we have a, a limited window here for people watching this video. Um, I would just uh, do a little uh, sales plug. <laughs> yes. Um, if people are interested uh, in, in learning more about what we're doing, uh, the book is Conquering the Crisis by Stephen Tweed. It's available on Amazon, uh, or you can get more information at conqueringthecrisis.com. And if we can help anyone in any way, uh, we're here to do that. I know you're doing that. We're working together. It's really about helping these organizations uh, grow because they're doing meaningful work, um, helping them provide exceptional customer experiences, uh, helping them create opportunities for their employees. And if we can do that, then we've made a difference. And, and uh, it's all good. Yeah, and is conqueringthecrisis.com, is that the best place for people to reach you if they have questions or comments? Yes, they can reach us there or, or at leadinghomecare.com. Leadinghomecare.com. homecare.com is, is our main website. And I'll make sure that I put those in the uh, notes below. Stephen, thank you so much. This was, like you said, I was looking at the time going, wow, <laughs> but we, it's because every time we talk, I think, we just, we both are very passionate about this subject. So I appreciate, uh, I learn from you every single time. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I really appreciate what you're doing with your red carpet work. And it's so, so important. So uh, let's do this again sometime soon. I would love that. I would love that. So this is, this is Donna Cutting at redcarpetlearning.com. If you found this video helpful, please hit like, comment below. I know Stephen would love to hear some of your experiences as well. So give us a little comment below the video. Um, and if you wanna see more of this, subscribe uh, and visit us at redcarpetlearning.com. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thanks to the audience and keep living and working the red carpet way.